I'm certainly not arguing that we should no longer retain, preserve, and display physical artifacts from the past, far from it. But rather, we must learn to accommodate current forms of creativity as well, and with the newer forms of presentation, access, and display that technology may support, both now and in the future, without necessarily knowing what that new technology might be. No one can predict exactly what the technology will look like going forward, but we must choose to bring it into the sphere of enterprise we all embrace, and indeed, written language uh, is not universally grasped even today. And scribes were once used in the past to read and write on behalf of those that could not. Today, computer programming languages are not easily grasped, although they are used to produce, namely computer programs are increasingly the essence of the digital age. So I think these ideas are best exemplified by a relatively new architecture called the digital object architecture, the essence of which I will try and describe in fairly high level terms shortly. However, I wish to begin by pointing out that an essential attribute of this architecture is the use of unique persistent identifiers to access information in the form of digital objects. For brevity, I sometimes refer to digital objects as DOs. As I indicated, a programming language is the mean by which a computer program may be expressed. However, for such programs to be accessed from storage, and here I include data and other information that may be incorporated within a computer program, and then processed after being accessed, these digital objects need to be, this information needs to be represented in digital form and properly structured. In general terms, this is what we refer to as a digital object. So let's see. Formally, uh, a digital object is a sequence of bits or a set of bit sequences that incorporates a work or portions of a work or other information in which a party has rights or interests or in which there is value. So this could be contracts, could be copyright material, it could be digital cash. And also, these digital objects have a, an associated unique persistent identifier that is resolvable to useful information about that object. That is, starting with the identifier, you're able to use it, perhaps by clicking on it or some other process to obtain this useful information. The ability to resolve an identifier in real time enables users, or rather programs that operate on their behalf, to learn certain critical data about the object, such as how to access it, where it might be located in, in the digital world, perhaps terms and conditions for use, authentication information, and even public keys when and if they are needed. This critical data is known as state information, state information about the digital object, and is created and maintained by the party that either created the object in the first place or is maintaining it on behalf of that party. Email was, first wide, was the first widely used application in the network world from the early 1970s. And although it has been supplanted to some extent by various social media today, it is still a primary medium of human communication for a large portion of the population. Now, many, if not most of you, are likely to be familiar with the web as another means of making information available and accessing it. And you might ask why that particular internet application is not sufficient by itself. Although they are fundamentally different, namely the web and the internet, many of you may even wonder what is the difference between the internet and the web. The web was created almost two decades after the internet first appeared and is mainly used today to access information in the internet. Had the web been created today for the first time, a web browser would almost surely be viewed as an app 
that you would download from an app store and run it in the internet. There are many current apps available today. This would be one more. But while neither email nor the web provides many of the most important features that we seek for the future, such as those concerning long-term preservation, authentication, and integrated management of security, these capabilities are really critical and are inherent in the digital object architecture, which is why I want to focus on that today. Curation and maintenance are important requirements for both physical artifacts and for information represented as or converted to digital form. However, one needs to know where to go to see physical artifacts. Perhaps it's in a limited or even a large number of museums. One also needs to know how or where to locate desired data or other information in digital form, which could be in millions or indeed billions of places in the internet of the future. And just as identifiers known as IP addresses in the internet have played a key role in routing information through the internet, other forms of identifiers known in this case as digital object identifiers, or more formally, what are called handles in the objects, will play a key role in accessing digital information in the future. So this idea of identifiers is really a linchpin of this whole architecture, along with digital objects themselves. For example, the publishing industry made a determination about two decades ago to give unique identifiers to their published material in digital form. Their rationale was to ensure that this information could be made available publicly, whether on CD-ROMs or in the internet, with cl clickable references to other information in the internet, without the need to change all the references, which could be millions or even billions, every time an IP address or a network provider were to change. By using unique identifiers for the digital objects to access the digital objects, they hoped and were successful in ensuring that the means of reference would remain intact and precise no matter what underlying technical changes were to agree and to, were to occur. The web and indeed the methods that preceded it used identifiers that were tied to some aspects of the underlying technology itself not the information. IP addresses identified specific machines. Machines can come and go, or ports on those machines. The web tied their identifiers called URLs, which m most of you use today with web browsers, to specific files on specific machines, rather than to the digital information contained in those files. And while the web has proven quite useful for accessing current materials, in digital form, and especially those that are publicly available and accessible, after a few years it becomes more difficult to find this desired information on the web using URLs, even if it's maintained by those responsible for its management. For example, in the early days, the, uh, you probably saw those 404 errors that you would get. Well, the half-life, that is, the period of time when half of these identifiers no longer worked, was approximately one or two years. Not very useful for archiving purposes or preservation. And about 95% of them didn't work after five years. You, you would like to understand that it is possible in general to maintain some of this information literally over the lifetime of a company, a nation, or perhaps in perpetuity. While I'm about to describe the digital object architecture, as I promised, I want to focus on its overall structure and functionality rather than its underlying technical details. This architecture resulted from earlier work um, that we had done on mobile programs that operated the internet on behalf of the users. At that time, we were trying to have a capability where you didn't have to do everything by fingers on a keyboard and noses coupled with screens on a seven by 24 basis. But at the time that we came up with this idea and started to pursue it, 
uh, mobile programs written by others had just become undesirable as the first worms, viruses, and Trojan horses were emerging in the internet. Sidelining the role of mobility and making use of the rest of the architecture resulted in a degree of comfort to many, and this is what became the digital object architecture. There will be many ways in which one can make use of this architecture, just as there are many ways to make use of computer programs or the internet in itself. Let me begin by re-emphasizing re that the architecture describes a logical extension of the internet uh, to enable the management of digital objects with the goal of ensuring continued accessibility to them despite changes to the underlying technology over time. It is a scalable framework upon which to build specific applications, much like the original internet architecture enabled. This architecture, the internet architecture, and particularly the TCP IP protocol that I was involved in creating, greatly simplified computer to computer communication. And the digital object architecture greatly simplifies accessing information on those machines or wherever in digital form and structured as digital objects. And it also enables interoperability between these digital objects. More specifically, the existence of the architecture lowers the barriers to implementing certain critical tasks that would otherwise prove challenging to design and implement without it, especially those tasks involving multiple parties for which common approaches are needed. It also provides for integrated security so that you can authenticate the received digital objects and perhaps even who can access them where appropriate. And finally, it enables interoperability between digital objects, a subject that has no real counterpart to the artifacts we create in the physical world today, but is clearly understood in a somewhat different way in the context of human communication. The overall objective is no longer just the movement of concepts and ideas in some appropriate form, but the cognitive interaction between two individuals or between computer programs acting on their behalf. It may even include autonomous interactions by and between computer programs themselves. I've been focusing on programming languages and computer programs, and then introduced the notion of digital objects and unique persistent identifiers. Well, why did I do this? Because even though we may be interested in the data or other information incorporated in this form of expression, the management of that information is actually in the form of binary digits or bits, structured as digital objects. So, for purposes of a management system, we need to make the transition from the underlying information to the means of managing it. This is not really too dissimilar from what the Postal Service does in conveying letters in physical form. They would likely not say they are conveying the information contained in the letters. Similarly, the digital object architecture is about conveying the digital objects, the bits, and that are suitably structured and performing other operations on these digital objects rather than conveying or operating on the information that may be incorporated within. In addition, digital objects may contain other digital objects so that one digital object that is encrypted results in a second digital object that has the first one integrated within it, but where the first cannot be accessed without the appropriate keys or permissions to unlock it, or where the second consists of a hash of the digital object or even perhaps a different object for purposes of authentication. This kind of structuring of a digital object might be informally referred to today as a blockchain. Indeed, a digital object may consist of a service that enables access to a large number of digital objects that are integrated within it. 
In addition, I'm sure you know the term metadata, which is commonly understood to mean data about data. But in this case, it refers to assertions about the digital objects, such as their provenance, identity, means of access, or aspects of their internal structures. The basic components of this architecture, each of which is assumed to be highly scalable and, and actually is in practice, are one, something called the DO repository in which DOs are stored and from which they may be accessed by supplying their identifiers. So you don't have to know about the technology that's being used, just the identifier. Number two, the DO registry, which stores metadata about the DOs and enables authorized searches to determine the identifiers, presuming they are not already known. There will be so many objects and identifiers that you certainly are not going to want to remember all those identifiers. So you need a way of finding, finding them, and many of them may be for personal and private information of your own that you don't want known to anyone else. And finally, the third component of this architecture is a resolution mechanism that maps a digital object's identifier to what I call state information about that specific digital object and allows it to be more rapidly processed. So let's see if this next slide is, I think this is one of the animated ones. Yeah, here it is. Let's see if this will work now. So there is an example of so if that works. Here's a repository that where digital objects are stored. Here is a resolution service, and I'll explain how that works, but this is what you provide an identifier to to figure out what to do with that identifier. Here's a resource discovery me mechanism, which I called a registry. And finally, here's the user. So he's running a client program. First thing it does, if it, doesn't, if it knows the identifier, it can start from that, but in, and you might get it by sending it to somebody in email, they might see it in a reference in the back of a journal, they may have read it in a newspaper. But in general, a user who's looking for something like a certain manuscript or a cultural artifact from the past doesn't know what its identifier is. So it goes into one of these DO registries to search it, and the searching can be based on Keywords, pictures, you know, whatever. It depends on the current state of the art in searching. So once you have an identifier for the thing you're looking for, this is a unique specifier of it, you go to the identifier resolution service, and that will tell you what you need to know in order to access it. So for example, it might say, go to that repository, one of maybe a billion around the globe. And so, you get that information back, and so that's what the way it's manifested. So that's typically what it would look like uh, when you use the the service. It's got these three different components. The archi architecture itself, as I will mention, is not proprietary, so anyone can build the components as long as they adhere to the standards that go along with it. The repository software provides a means for insulating the user from the myriad technical details of the underlying storage mechanisms, be they disks, large database systems, or even those provided by cloud computing systems. The user supplies the identifiers and the DO repository software provides the digital objects, provided the user is authorized to access them. So they could be your health records, and you've stipulated that you should be the only one to access it, could be bank information, it could be tax returns, it could be published documents that you want everybody to get. So you have the ability to control who can access that, again, by the use of identifiers. So I, I will shortly come back to the critical question of knowing which of the many possible repositories to ask, um, as there could well be these billions of them, especially with the introduction of the so-called Internet of Things, which I will manage, which I will mention. The registry software enables one to find the identifiers for these digital objects based on the stored metadata about those objects, which are provided by the parties that created the objects in the first place. So here we have 
two basic issues. One is how to carry out efficient metadata searches, including allowing for new and improved searching techniques that may be invented or discovered in the future. The second issue, though, assuming the existence of many metadata registries, is similar to the questions about which repository to ask, namely, which registry should you ask? In this case, however, any of several approaches may be used. One is where users have a known set of registries that they use to meet most of their searching requirements. And number two is where most accessible registries federate with other public and or private registries to share information about which of them can best deal with specific search requests, perhaps by topic area or other mutually agreed domains of interest. And then they cooperate in generating an effective response for the user, or hopefully effective. This architecture that I'm describing, uh, as I said, came out of the work on mobile programs that we did many years ago after we decided to sign line the mobility part. We could always introduce it at any point in time because I think the architecture itself is the best mechanism for providing the protection against uh, these mobile programs that people were most concerned about. And this particular architecture won one of the major awards in the field from the digital ID world uh, community for combining innovation with practical reality. So that's a picture of what the award looked like. And there are very few architectures based on identifiers that have ever been uh, honored in that way. So I, I was very pleased when that occurred um, a while back. This particular architecture incorporates many of the same properties as the original internet did. Namely, it's an open architecture, which means it's got defined interfaces, protocols, and, and messages that move back and forth. It's scalable in the sense that it can grow. There's no limit on the number of objects, the number of repositories, the number of registries, and the number of identifiers. Indeed, it is a logical extension of the internet. Now, one of the things that the internet really did achieve was providing a capability with a minimal amount of complexity. It is the essential element of designing infrastructure, in my, in my view. Just like the electrical infrastructure has a very simple interface, you put a plug into the wall and you can invent anything that can make use of electricity, but the infrastructure is agnostic about it, does not know about it. Uh, that's the same challenge that we had here. So I believe this, this architecture is about as simple and uncomplex an architecture as one can develop if you want to deal with the issues of long-term preservation, interoperability, integrated security, and the like. Um, and then finally, I want to say something about a specific aspect of scaling, and, and that has to do with the Internet of Things. So this is a, a term that, to me, is kind of a misnomer because, to me, what people call the Internet of Things is really the Internet. In fact, in the early days of computer networking, the, what we connected to those nets were things. They were big computer systems. They were actually information systems that you navigated, as I said, with your fingers and looked at results on the screen or on paper. But uh, if the internet of the future for things uh, were to include even little things like a thermometer, I think we don't want a, th a thermometer connected where all you can do is ask it, what's the temperature right now? a temporal request. What you probably want to do is ask it about the high and low today or the average temperature in the last week, maybe not in perpetuity. And so every one of these things, I believe, in the future will be viewed as a little mini information system that supports the digital object architecture, which means every one of these things can now interface with every other thing through the interface protocol, which I'm about to describe. Um, and because you could have billions or even people are now projecting hundreds of billions of these things within the next decade or two, 
um, you could have billions or even hundreds of billions of repositories. So which of these repositories would you ask for a given digital object, such as the average temperature in Liege, or this room, or your hotel floor? Uh, well, the IoT is perhaps a whole separate topic of discussion. Uh, I don't plan to go into that today, obviously, but it does illustrate the very fundamental kinds of questions that you need to deal with in scalability. So uh, if you don't want to individually ask all of these billions of repositories to find out which one has the information, that's why this architecture includes a resolution system. It will accept an identifier if you have one from the user of the user's program and provide, provide the needed information to know where to go to ask that information. But early on in describing this notion to banks and corporations and organizations of all kinds, most of those organizations strongly preferred to maintain and manage that kind of state information themselves. It's like they're cataloging system for their own information, where the bank records are, where their corporate information is. Um, and so this actually led, instead of a single system that could provide the resolution, to a large system of local resolution services around the globe. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, today we probably have uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of them, and there could easily be a million or more of these local resolution services around the globe. And so the problem occurs again. Which of these local resolution services do you ask for the state information to know which of these billions of repositories to then go ask for the digital objects that you're interested in? The alternative of a single location for all the records, uh, all these identifier records, not the digital objects, but just the records about where they are, perhaps, even if mirrored at multiple locations, uh, would be a very poor choice, in my view, as it could easily become overloaded with data and resolution requests. Okay, so. I'm not going to go through the rest of this time, but that's what an identifier looks like. You'll see that it's got a prefix on the front. Let's see if this will do it. Prefix on the front. A prefix is something that's given to the organization that is creating its own identifiers. So whatever it adds to it, which is the suffix side, is, is a choice of their own. It could be numbered one, two, three, four, five, but if everybody numbered everything one, two, three, four, five, whose number five is it that you're talking about? So by putting a unique prefix in front, then it guarantees that whole string is unique, and that's what this resolution system resolves. A string like this called a handle, or more generally, a digital object identifier. So I'm not gonna go through the rest of this. We'll go back. Okay. Okay. So um, the, the solution, as I said, was inherent in that basic form of structure, namely, if we could just keep track of these pieces, the prefix parts, then we would know where to go to put the whole identifier into play and ask that place for uh, what the identifier record is, because they would have created it in the first place, and nobody else would have been able to do that. Um, so today, there, as I said, there are many thousands of these organizations to which unique prefixes have been allotted, and each of them operates a local identifier service known as local handle service. These so-called prefix handle records are stored in what we call a global handle registry. The, the acronym we use is GHR. Um, since there are so much fewer, many fewer prefix records than there are digital object identifier records, having them available in a single registry that's mirrored globally is not a performance issue at all. Uh, and in fact, this system has been continuously working on the internet since the early 1990s 
It's in very widespread use and is extremely reliable. Virtually any journal that you pick up in the scientific or technical world or the medical world uses this system and this system of identifiers to identify the articles. Um, from its inception in the, uh, in, until I guess late 2015, my organization, CNRI, ran this global handle registry, the GHR, um, uh, until, until I guess uh, it was probably December of that year, we transferred the overall responsibility for running this GHR um, to a nonprofit entity we set up in Geneva called the Dona Foundation that Adama mentioned earlier to enable the adoption of this technology to be more palatable uh, around the globe. Because um, everybody who looked at it was very concerned about where the root of the system is. And since identifiers are key to it, it was determined that Geneva was acceptable to everyone we talked about. So that's why the foundation was set up there. The uh, Dona Foundation is now responsible for the evolution of this architecture. And it provides for the overall administration of the Global Handle Registry. At present, there are eight organizations that have been authorized by Donna to operate as administrators of the GHR in dealing with the public, and a few more are anticipated in the next two years, while we take stock of how well this system of multiple cooperating um, administrators is actually working. And meanwhile, Efforts are underway in various parts of the world uh, to apply the digital object architecture to a wide range of social, societal needs, whether public or private, or some combination thereof. Of course, I expect some of these will be purely nonprofit, some commercial, some governmental, and many a collaboration of multiple parties. Um, this slide talks about ITU recommendation X1255, which I commend to you. This is actually a international standard which is based on the digital object architecture and it discusses the components of the architecture, in particular the digital object data model and a protocol for interoperability known as, in that case it was, digital objects were known as digital entities. Um, I think, to my, to my way of thinking, they're, they're basically the same as digital objects. So whether it's called DEIP in that document or DOIP, which uh, is the term we used, uh, it's the way that you can actually interface with the information that's in a digital object. You interface with the digital object itself, in other words. So this is a schematic view of what a Deal repository might, might conceptually be like, but in fact, when we talk about it, we really talk about the interface protocol to it, the digital object interface protocol, and the software that receives those protocol inputs, and then based on identifiers only, it finds the appropriate digital object in whatever storage exists at the back end. And as I said earlier, that could be anything from a thumb drive, a disk drive, a RAID array, it could be a database system as big as an Oracle database or smaller, it could be a cloud service or in fact multiple cloud services where it pulls the digital object back from various components, presents it uniformly back to the user. Now in fact, not only do you specify the object that you're looking for, digital object based on its identifier, you also specify the action to be taken based on an identifier for a digital object that contains the program which can apply to that digital object. So those are the two things that typically are presented, the target and the action to be applied to that target just based on identifiers. So the entire technology for storage could change dramatically between now and any time in the future and it would be completely insulated from the user who would have to know nothing about what is used there, no command languages, don't have to know about how things are done in databases. You need to understand about the objects you get back. And furthermore, these queries can actually 
get you elements of the digital object. So for example, if that object were uh, to be, let's say, a medical record, you could imagine pulling back the entire medical record in the form of a digital object, but you might also say, just provide me the, the reading in the element that's of type cholesterol or type blood pressure or type whatever it is you're interested in. So you can actually, the protocol will actually delve into the digital objects to provide the parts of those objects that you care the most about. Now, so this is what, um, this is what it looks like in, in words, so I won't say much more about that. I did have a um, much more detailed slide about the um, identifier system, but let me just say a few words about complexity. Um, we, we understand that evolution and increased use of technology will provide both challenges and opportunities. Mobile programs may play a larger role in managing complexity in the future and may help us to accommodate the sheer volume of information that can be, become available. There are many open source implementations of typical programs that you know, you know about, and there are open source implement, software implementations of the basic components of the digital object architecture available on the internet, and you can download them. I encourage those of you who are interested in, in applying this in your, in your fields to consider their use as you contemplate how best to address the issues of preserving our cultural heritage. However, as the digital architecture, digital object architecture is not proprietary, any organization may write its own software implementations and uh, I encourage you to do that if you choose to. So in closing, and I guess we're gonna get a couple of minutes back uh, from what I thought would be the full hour, uh, I encourage you all to contemplate how information technology can impact basic notions in the humanities, including how best to preserve cultural aspects of society. In the process, uh, the digital object architecture may be a useful starting point for managing this information and for making it more widely accessible in the future. So thank you all for your attention. I uh, hope you found this uh, interesting and, and relevant to what you may be interested in thinking about going forward. And I wish you all the best for the rest of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much. Uh, merci beaucoup, Bob. En réalité, je regardais la salle. Je voyais un public très attentif dans l'ensemble. Très attentif. Je sais que parmi vous, il y a des gens qui sont familiers avec ces notions. Mais peut-être beaucoup qui ne le sont pas. J'avais souhaité que Bob Kahn puisse introduire la communauté scientifique des humanités à cette problématique qui est une vraie révolution. On a dit Internet a bouleversé, à l'époque quand ça se mettait en place, on dit ça va bouleverser notre manière de vivre, de travailler, même de penser. Bouleversement. L'Internet des objets, qui est une extension de l'Internet, va véritablement révolutionner notre manière de vivre et notre relation aux autres et aux objets. En plus, pour nous, ce qui est très très important, c'est les éléments fondamentaux qu'il a évoqués. Simplifier et démocratiser l'accès à l'information. Ça, c'est extraordinaire. Pour nous, les spécialistes, entre guillemets, des humanités, c'est extraordinaire que nous arrivions à mieux communiquer, à mieux gérer l'information, et une information sécurisée. La traçabilité de tous les objets, pour ceux qui travaillent dans les gouvernements, on pourra désormais lutter contre les fraudes, grâce à ce mécanisme-là. Enfin bref, 
je ne vais pas refaire loin s'en fout, je n'en ai pas la capacité. Je voulais simplement attirer votre attention pour ceux qui n'ont pas peut-être compris, parce que c'est nouveau, que c'est quelque chose d'extraordinaire auquel il faut être désormais attentif et que vous puissiez, à travers la documentation que vous pouvez avoir sur Internet, sur l'Internet de Zolgé, vous familiariser avec cette problématique qui est nouvelle et qui va bouleverser, révolutionner, je dirais même, notre manière de travailler, de vivre et de comprendre le monde autour de nous, en nous donnant une plus grande capacité d'accès à une information sécurisée et à une gestion de cette information sécurisée. Thank you so much, Bob. Merci beaucoup. Je crois qu'on a cinq minutes pour juste le temps de changer de position afin que la prochaine session, qui est une séance plénière sur le patrimoine culturel, vous savez, les autres choses s'articulent, hein. il parlait de patrimoine culturel, l'intérêt des objets peut nous aider à conserver, à préserver le patrimoine culturel, et bien nous allons voir ce que ça veut dire à travers la présentation sur le patrimoine culturel. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much.